had known about the Iowa Tent Colony since I, I came here to work in the Daily Times in the 1970s. Um, and I think I, I even did a, a small article about it back then. But uh, when I started doing this book, uh, two things I found out. One uh, was that uh, so few people in Ottawa had even heard of the Tent Colony. And that's understandable because it was a long time ago and it's been gone for a long time. Um, I also found out how little I knew about tuberculosis itself. Um, it has some you know, amazing uh, statistics about it. Um, so I will start my, my talk on it and I will uh, go through some photos that I have as I go along. Um, in the early 20th century, Ottawa, Illinois was in the forefront revolutionary effort to combat tuberculosis. <coughs> tuberculosis was, was known as consumption because it ravaged and consumed the body. It attacked the lung and the victims wasted away. There was no cure or no real treatment. A Dr. James Wiley Pettit of Ottawa took an interest in tuberculosis after recovering from a bout in the 1890s. At that time, physicians sent their patients to warm, dry climates in the Southwest, believing that was the best for their lungs. However, Dr. Pettit's research led him to believe that a patient could be cured in any climate, and it was better for a patient to remain in his own location with his own doctor and his own family for support. He also believed that fresh air and a nutritious diet were the keys to a cure. This meant, kept, uh, this meant keeping patients outdoors at all times, in freezing winters and blazing hot summers. Tuberculosis is fatal unless treated early. Unlike COVID-19 or the flu, which are caused by a virus, tuberculosis is a bacterial infection. It cannot be overstated how widespread and deadly tuberculosis has been throughout human history. For centuries, it was the leading cause of death in the world. TB is estimated to have killed more than one billion people in the past two centuries, according to the CDC. Center for Disease Control, and the WHO, World Health Organization. That's right, one billion in the last 200 years. And you can add hundreds of millions of more deaths because TB has been known to mankind as far back as 3400 BC. The CD and the WHO have said that by the dawn of the 19th century, TB had killed one in seven people who had ever lived. TB is still a worldwide pandemic, and it kills about one and a half million people every year around the world. Not so much in the United States, but in some of the undeveloped countries, that's where uh, it, it's at its worst now. So at the end of the 19th century, a consensus was formed in the medical community that the open air treatment should be used for patients in the early stage of the disease. The idea began in the 1850s in Europe, Dr. Edward Trudeau opened his facility in 1884 in Saranac, Saranac Lake, New York, after cur curing himself of TB using this method. It was in January 1904 when the Illinois State Medical Society announced its war against TB. At its annual meeting in Bloomington in May 1904, 500 physicians chose Dr. Pet Pettit to head the effort. Dr. Pettit said, quote, we are not seeking to exploit some new and untried medical fad but agencies which are at the command of almost everyone. These are mainly the scientific application of fresh air, nutritious food, rest and exercise. But what is more important, we want to teach the public how to prevent the disease and thus save 6,000 to 7,000 lives in, in this state each year. The claim may seem extravagant, but given an opportunity, we will prove it. Now, Dr. Pettit was born in 1848, downstate Sparta. He enlisted in Company K, the 142nd Illinois Infantry, in June 1864. He was 15 years old. He graduated from Louisville Medical College in 1873 and began his practice in Ottawa in 1877. He became president of the Illinois State Medical Society in 1908. After contracting TB in 1892, he left town for several years to recover. He went up to Sheridan. He returned to continue his practice and took a special interest in tuberculosis. He rejected the idea that a hot, dry climate was important to combat TB. In a trip to Europe in 1902, Dr. Pettit saw that the results were similar, whether patients were treated in the Swiss Alps 
with cold air at a high altitude or the Mediterranean with warm weather at sea level. Dr. Pettit observed that the same results uh, happened in America, whether it was in the cold Adirondacks, in Colorado's high altitude, New Mexico's dry air, or California's warm cli climate at sea level. He concluded that climate was not a factor and patients could recover in Illinois as well as anywhere. It was important to treat patients in their home climate, he thought. So the Ottawa tent, he opened the Ottawa tent colony in 1904 on the south side of the Illinois River. That's where the UAW facility is today. After a few years, nine by 10 foot wooden huts, sometimes called cottages, replaced the cap campus tents. The colony accepted only early cases of tuberculosis. It was a private facility and not a state institution. It cost between 18 and $30 a week. <coughs> now the tents and huts were equipped with electricity for lights and electric blankets, which kept their bodies warm, even if the blankets sometimes had an inch or two of snow on them. <laughs> a permanent administration building called the clubhouse was built in 1905. The emphasis was on nutrition, with three meals a day and two additional lunches. The patients were served five or six quarts of milk a day, six to 12 raw eggs, meat, and a lot more. Instead of wasting away, as tuberculosis did to his patients, most patients gained weight. A news item in the Ottawa Free Trader on October 25th, 1907 said, quote, Miss Christine Liska of Milwaukee, who has been a patient at the Ottawa Tent Colony, and is known as the sunshine of the colony, returned home Saturday after a year's treatment for TB. Miss Liska gained 55 pounds. Now eating all that food was not a chore because outdoors, being outdoors worked up quite a healthy appetite. And this addressed the two main concerns, fresh air to heal the lungs and a lot of food to prevent from losing weight. A story in the Iowa Daily Republic on the, day, uh, on the day before the colony opened said, quote, one of the first things to be observed will be rigid enforcement of a rule against spitting. Breakfast will be served promptly at seven o'clock. At 10 o'clock, the patient will be given a quantity of milk and dry egg. At noon, dinner will be served and will consist of beef steak and roast beef with vegetables and fruits of all kind and ice cream dessert, but no pastry or confections. Again in the afternoon, another ration of milk and egg will be taken. Supper will be at the usual hour and of an ordinary character. And at 9 o'clock, more milk and egg, and then to bed. Six meals a day, fresh air, rest, quiet, re recreation, and sleep make up the prescription for the patient whose hopes of life hang by a thread." End quote. The public was, was not allowed on the grounds unless invited to keep the curious people away. The ground had 100 signs painted on wood boards, nailed to all the trees. And, ev and every sign was different, but they all warned against spitting. <laughs> now, Dr. Pettit hoped the state would make his experiment into a, a state institution. He led a de delegate of 20 physicians in 1905 to lobby the state legislature to appropriate $200,000 to establish, establish a state TB sanitarium. The state Senate appropriated only 100000 and the house cut the figure to 25,000. Dr. Pettit and the State Medical Society knew this was not enough, so they told Governor Deneen to veto the bill. It was decided the TB sanitarium would be a private institution. Dr. Pettit said, quote, we, we hope to make this a charitable institution, but we could not get the legislature to give us enough money. Credit for success is due to the patients who live here, lived here through the last winter. We tell the patients the truth. We don't cure them. We teach them how to, how to live and send them home to cure themselves. We have demonstrated that tents can be used in cold climates, and we have reached hundreds of thousands of sufferers. The first thing proved is that the climate has no special significance, and that food is of the utmost <coughs> value. We do not do anything here but eat and rest and breathe God's air. It costs $1.33 a day to feed each patient. They get the best we can buy. An account in the, the Journal of the uh, American Medical Association said, quote, the charge the Ottawa Tent Colony patients are stuffed with food was refuted by Dr. Pettit, who showed that the in increased combustion caused by the open air treatment and the wasting nature of the disease demanded greater quantities of food. 
After Pettit told a conference on state charities in October 1909 that the cost of TB could be seen in the cost of lives, disability, unhappiness, and money. Quote, the cost in lives in the United States, states is estimated at 150,000 annually. If a forecast for the deaths in the future is computed based on the basis of the now living and the death rate in the past, it is safe to say that five million people now living in the United States are doomed to die of TB unless conditions are changed. Of this number, about 9,000 die annually in the state of Illinois. <coughs> Dr. Pettis said the cost was not just in medical treatment, it was also in the loss of earnings and the cost of burials. He cited a study that the annual loss in the United States to TB was 1.1 billion. Almost every consumptive who dies actually has cost more in dollars and cents than it would have taken to cure him if the disease had been discovered and treated in time, Dr. Pettis said. In an article for the Illinois Medical Journal in February 1911, Dr. Pettit said that in the colony six years, there had been 1,100 cases admitted with 90% cured. Now, a two-story building was uh, built in 1911, just east of the, where the clubhouse is, for a laboratory and other medical facilities. Dr. Pettit also built Ottawa's second hospital, Illinois Valley Hospital, on the grounds of the 10th colony in 1915. Now, that hospital later became Ottawa General. Um, each room was connected to a veranda so cots could be pushed outside. After the daily regimen of food and fresh air, lights were to be out and windows were to be open by 9.30 p.m. Quote, never stay out of doors while you are chilly, but learn to never be chilly out of doors. Patients were expected to live out uh, expected to live outdoors 20 hours a day and needed to dress appropriately. Woolen underclothing with long sleeves was advised, but chest protectors were not allowed. Quote, men should wear woolen shirts and corduroy trousers. Women's dresses should be loose fitting with high collars and long sleeves with wooden, a woolen petticoat or bloomers. Hoods or caps should cover the ears and the forehead. Mittens are preferred instead of gloves. Preferred footwear included woolen socks, low heel, sheepskin shoes, and leggings that buttoned up to the knee. Rub your feet in the morning and at night was good for keeping them warm. <coughs> and the Ottawa Free Trader told, told of below zero weather in, in a December 30th, 1904 story. Quote, while the blizzard was upon us the other day, you were probably very busy with fire and furnace. So busy that you probably never gave a thought to the inhabitants of the Ottawa Tent Colony on the bluff south of the city. If you did think of them, you probably threw in an extra sh shiver or two and permitted great gobs of sympathy to well up in your heart, all of up which was uncalled for and unnecessary. While the wind was blowing at a gale of 70 miles an hour, the patients over there stuck to their tents and they suffered, not at all." End quote. quote. The winter of 1904-1905 was especially bad in this locality, Dr. Pettit wrote. During the first winter, provision was made to house the patients during the cold weather. They all, however, of their own accord, remained in their tents. This during a winter where the thermometer on several occasions was 25 and 30 below zero. Instead of suffering from the cold, they were comfortable and enjoyed the experiment. Dr. Pettit told a medical conference in 1905, quote, it sounds as if it was a hardship sleeping in the open air, but patients never found it so when they actually undertake it. A man or a woman living under such conditions acquires an enor enormous appetite. Eating every day three meals, two lunches, six to 12 eggs, and drinking from five to six quarts of milk. This repairs the, the past and daily waste and builds up the patient. In an article on July 8, 1904, it said, quote, the tents that, that will be occupied by the campers are of two sizes all being provided with substantial board floors several inches above the ground. The 9 by 12 tents are for two occupants. The 7 by 9 tents are for a single camper. The tents are provided with a good iron bed, wire springs, and mattress, and a complete camper's toilet outfit. Campers furnish their own bedding. It is a drugless institution in which no medicines are to be administered to the patient. <coughs> um, 
I found this a, a very interesting, and, and uh, this is in the book. I'll just read part of it now. One, one of the patients had a, a letter published in the Chicago Daily News in May 1912, and it gives such a good insight into the daily life of, uh, of the colony. And, and it's, it's so well written, too. Quote, the northwest wind raced across a stretch of low country, over the frozen river, over the ridge of high land, and swept howling away in the prairies to the south. The canvas walls of the tent fluttered and tugged in their stays as the full force of the wind struck the little group of them snuggled together on the bluff. At the clubhouse, the large windows rattled and shook in, the, in their sashes, and the snow swept madly across the long porch. The thick black smoke from the kitchen chimney was driven before it had left the chimney. But inside the house, all was cozy, and inside the little tents, or in front, sheltered from the wind, patients were snugly taking the cure. The wind, the storm, the cold were a matter of course. The colony was prepared. A long, dreary winter had settled down, and the colonists were making the best of it. Mealtime, this was an important occasion, for it was only for meals for afternoon temperatures that we enjoyed the comfort of the warm house. And for an hour or so, we lived like other people. A stranger entering the dining hall at one of these occasions could hardly believe that we were consumptives. Most of us, most of us looked so well, much better than the average person in the village or the people who caught a glimpse of the colony from the car and who looked at us so sympathetically. We were a happy lot, seemingly free from care and worry, for therein lay half the cure not to worry. So we fostered cheeriness and good fellowship till it became, after a while, a happy, spontaneous cheeriness instead of being premeditated. What friendships have been woven together? Here, where one needs encouragement and the help of friendship. I don't know whether it was because we were brought together closer through sympathy and understood each other better because of the disease we had in common, or because each one of us took it upon himself to pass around as much cheer as he could, or what, but the spirit of the colony was remarkable and the good nature practiced by both management and patients made the long cold days pass swiftly. And he continues, it was grand, it was just what I craved, to have a rest night next to nature. I thought of this, I had plenty of time to think, for often I found it too cold to breathe. My fingers almost froze through, through my heavy gloves as I sat, blanketed in my chair. The electric pad kept the feet warm by day, warmed the bed while the patient was at house for supper, and worked faithfully all night from the head of the bed to the foot. Often I have been thankful for it. When I wake up in the morning early, feeling the least bit chill, I only had to sneak out an arm, turn the switch, and in a minute, the juice would be sizzling through the wires to the pad. Cold feet with an electric pad and fleece-lined shoes? I should say not. Cold feet are a detriment to the cure. War must be kept the feet, even to the sacrifice of appearance, which even the women made as they plodded along the narrow board paths to the clubhouse, wearing those large sheepskin shoes over their street shoes. In their chairs, quote, the awful big feet were hidden under the blankets. In the dining hall at meat meal time, the patients sat th three or four to a table. The women had their separate tables and the men had their own. Here the appetite, having been wetted by the crisp cold air, we did justice to our wholesome meals. There was an art, or rather a knack, of getting wrapped up in our blankets, even with the help of a nurse. But to crawl in successfully alone was quite an accomplishment, for one had to first wrap up in a large horse blanket, place the electric pad at the feet, tuck the blanket tight to keep out the wind, and then after the first blanket had been secured, gathered it around to throw a smaller one, usually a steamer rug or a lap robe, over the leg and feet, reclined in the steamer chair, and at the same time, gather snugly around the shoulders. Quote, in the kiosk, open to the south and sheltered from the wind, the men sat. Here they took the cure together. Here farmers, clerks, machinists, men from all walks of life spent hours and hours of inactivity, but still at the work in the business of getting well. Here good fellowships abound. Each one had did his best to make the hours seem shorter and to soften the routine of the colony life. And he continued, it was a simple life. Rest, fresh air, and wholesome food. 
three fundamental principles of the cure were worked out to a science, and it was up to us to follow it out. It was no hardship. We were often given sympathy where none was needed, but we didn't mind it. We saw no reason why people should feel sorry for us. We played the game as determinedly and conscientiously as we knew. We were happy, contented, and comfortable. We were fighting for our health and winning. We laughed at the winter. I thought it was a pretty good uh, narrative given by that man. Dr. Arthur Patek uh, in the Wisconsin Medical Journal in 1904 said, quote, the su success thus far attained in the Ottawa Tent Colony has demonstrated beyond all doubt that TB can be cured in Illinois as easily and successfully as anywhere else. Nearly all patients admitted who are not in an advanced stage of the disease have been materially benefited, and several have been discharge, discharged as consequences. <coughs> the results of tent life may th thus be briefly summarized. The appetite increases, nutrition improves, cough decreases, night sweats cease, sleep improves, and the pulse rate is reduced. A marked improvement has been observed in all stages of the disease, but in the early cases, the results are the most satisfactory. The patients are, for the most part, cheerful and contented with their surroundings. <coughs> As a rule, they accept uncomplainingly the primitive life which the treatment imposes. Now, there was another TB tent colony. It was the Buffalo Rock Tent Colony. It was across uh, the state uh, uh, Star Rock. It opened in 1908, 1908, and it closed after just a few years. Um, it was listed for sale in 1911. The big sand companies tried to buy it. They wanted to level Buffalo Rock for its silica sign, sand, just wiped it out. Mm -hmm. um, but the Crane Corporation of Chicago bought it in 1912 as a recreation area for its employees. In 1928, they donated it to the state, so it was safe. But, um, I, I don't go into, into it too much in this talk. But in the book, there's just a long narrative of, of the battle. It was quite a battle. In Ottawa, you know, the women's club was raising money to try to buy. They tried to talk the county board into buying it, and the county board wasn't interested. The poor farmers out that way, he said, you know, you could be right next to the poor farm, you know, you, you, you all this, and you could buy it cheaply. The county board just wouldn't do it. They didn't want it. But it, it was a legitimate issue. It was in danger of being bought and, and, and leveled. Thankfully, it wasn't. Um, a sanitarium was the goal of Dr. Pettit from the beginning. He hoped that Buffalo Rock might be the site of a sanitarium, since it already had the buildings from the other tent colony. A, t a county TV sanitari sanitarium was built in 1918, just west of the tent colony. A, a larger brick building replaced it in 1939. You might remember that one. It's sort of a yellow brick uh, building. Um, by 1921, the tents and huts were no longer being used. Many of them remained on the property until the 1950s. The entire world of TB treatment changed in 1944 when streptomycin was discovered. Medicine could now fight tuberculosis. Open air treatment was done. And sanitariums began to close. By the late 1950s, the last in the nation were gone. Chicago's municipal TB sanitarium started in 1911 on Chicago's northwest side and was one of the largest in the nation. Edward Hospital in Naperville began in 1907 as a TB sanitarium. As the TB epidemic in America subsided after the streptomycin, Edward Hospital became a general hospital in 1955. It's one of the bigger hospitals. It's Edward Elmhurst now, one of the big, bigger hospital systems in the Chicago area now. Um, Arizona had become a haven for people with TB, bringing more people than mining, ranching, farming, or commerce. Approximately 70% of the Arizona territory was infected with TB in 1900, according to the Arizona Medical Association. Colorado also promoted its climate. In fact, many of the people who built Help build the state were there seeking a cure from TB. The 14 acre tent colony on Otto's east side on East Center Street was sold in 1949 to the United Auto Workers as a regional educational center. All the buildings eventually were torn down except the historic clubhouse. 
and I don't know if you've been out there, I was out there when I was doing this book, and it's just beautiful. Um, the UAW has, uh, has, UAW has restored the building. Um, it's beautiful inside. They have displays of the tent colony. They're, they're proud of uh, the heritage of the property, and you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier with, with what they've done. John F. Kennedy and Barack Obama spoke there during their campaigns for president. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Coretta Scott King, stayed there in the 1960s using the, the Center to Plan Civil Rights Strategy with their aides because it was one of the few places at the time where black and white people could stay at the same time. Sometimes if, if a union or other organization would have a conference in Chicago or any place else, white people had to go to one hotel, black people had to go to another hotel, same with the restaurants. Not in Ottawa. They stayed in the same Ottawa uh, UAW hotel, ate together in the same dining hall, which sounds, you know, so what to now, but back then that was that was a big deal. Uh, a tornado, as you know, devastated parts of Ottawa and they played in 2017. It destroyed the hotel. But it was rebuilt the following year. It was it, it, even bigger. Um, the UAW has respected the history of the tent colony by keeping the 1905 clubhouse as original as possible. The dining hall looks almost the same as it did a century ago. And large windows give diners a look at the beautiful Illinois River below the bluff with a view of the islands and the city of Ottawa in the distance. I have some, uh, some pictures I want to show you too. This one, this one came from the Library of Congress. And this is a man sitting outside one of the, the TV huts in Ottawa. Uh, <coughs> a lot of the uh, pictures I'm going to show you are from old uh, colored postcards, which is good because without them, we wouldn't have much uh, to, to see. Here's a couple of the huts. You can see a man on the right sitting in, in a lounge chair outside. And that's, that was their whole business, just get well. This is another photo of a man sitting outside. You can see a, an old-fashioned swing, some of the, the, um, the tents, the uh, huts there. This is a line of cottages. You see a little boy sitting outside. Each, each cottage had a number, so you know which one, because that one looked alike. All the huts looked the same, so you can see <coughs> which one you went to. This was a clubhouse in the early 1900s. It's uh, changed a little bit, but basically the same. The, there, there's the clubhouse looking down the bluff, and you can see some of the factories in Ottawa in the distance. Entrance of the clubhouse, you can see the, the tents. And thank goodness for these old postcards because without them, we wouldn't have too many new visuals. <clears throat> you see the medical facility, the hospital he, he started to build to the left. And another view. You see the tents in the background. Summertime. Another nice view in the summertime. 
like a, a nice place to be. Side, you can see how deep the snow is. The note on the card says, the young lady standing near the tree between two young men is Madame Claudia. almost the same today. You can see the clock on the wall in the back. <clears throat> they still have that. They fixed it. It's in the dining hall and it's working. You see the back wall there? That's, uh, uh, they have that fixed up as sort of the serving line. It's facing opposite. All this, it's facing opposite the windows. The, the view. That's the uh, laboratory in the TV uh, Colony Hospital, Dr. Pettit built. That's also an old postcard. Some of those bottles on the wall um, are on display in the UAW uh, building now. I mean, they're, they're very proud of, uh, of uh, what it used to be. Now that's, that's the main building. that Dr. Pettit built. I don't know if any of you remember that at all, do you? Because that, that was not, not, I don't believe that was out of the general hospital. I think this was the, um, I think this was another building. <coughs> That's another view of it. It's a place where the patient <coughs> This is not Ottawa, this is another facility, but I use some pictures in the book of other facilities to show what Ottawa, uh, what, what it looked like in Ottawa. Because this, this, this would be the same thing in Ottawa, I just don't have photos of Ottawa. But when you look at other facilities that were doing the same thing, you can imagine this, this is what it looked like. And you, if you notice, the beds have wheels on them, so they can be wheeled outside. in Iowa. been out there, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful sight. You know, you stand in the back porch, back veranda, and you look down the bluff, and it's just a beautiful sight. And today, the UAW uses the whole facility for conferences and, and uh, uh, even some police and fire um, conventions. And you can use the building. That is one of the Ottawa tents. See a man standing, and <coughs> another man laying down taking food to the, out to the uh, patients in their huts who couldn't come to the dining hall. This was given to me by, you see the man on, on the right? Um, his uh, granddaughter-in-law gave me this photo. 
that man's father died of TB. So he volunteered taking meals to the patients. And that story is quite an interesting story. It goes very deeply into Ottawa because it, 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 they were in Ottawa. This house still stands. It's across the street from the uh, love house. It was the nurse's house. It's where the nurses live. Um, it's a private house now, and it looks almost the same as it did then. There it is today. There it is then. I mean, even the tree in front of the sidewalk in front is still there. torn down in the sand. View top. View, they also ground the bluff. Another old postcard. That's the Ottawa TV sanitary that was built in 1939, just across the tent colony, a little bit to the, to the west of it. Once the uh, medicine was developed to fight TB, the sanitariums were no longer necessary. For a while, this became a nursing home. And I think it eventually was torn down around 2000 or so, wasn't it? And out of the spot was, uh, uh, the, behind this was a county detention home. This and the county de detention home were torn down and out of a pavilion nursing home was built. So it wasn't facing Center Street. <clears throat> like this was. It faced, I think, the lover. lover. This was uh, a campaign in Chicago. In 1915, they wanted to build a TV <clears throat> sanitary. And they thought it was going to be a hard sell. Um, and they uh, uh, had a, a, a campaign to get out the vote to fund this, to build this. And, uh, and it passed. This shows a tent in Colorado. Um, and like I said, a, a good part of Colorado was built by TB patients and, and their families who, who went there. Um, that's what brought them to the state. This is a tent uh, from, an, I think it's an unknown location, not Iowa, but uh, you, can see, you can see the beds inside. And I think a, a, a lot of times they would just open the flaps of the tent so the air could come in. It didn't matter how cold it was. This was Edward Sanitarium in Naperville. That's how it looked when it was built. And if, you, if you have been there to see, that, see the hospital now, it's, it's gigantic. Gigantic kind of light. I believe this is from inside Edward Sanitarium too, but it would look the same if it was in Ottawa in the TV Sanitarium. These are huts being built um, somewhere down south, I think it is. This, I believe, is, is in Arizona. This is just another uh, variation of, uh, of a bed outside when it's warm enough. And she looks, she looks happy. You know, she's, they, according to all the sources I've seen, they did not complain. They knew it was this or die. This, I believe, is from New York, but it, it, it would show the same thing <coughs> if it was in Ottawa. This is in Chicago, I believe. It's, it's a living where you can wheel the beds outside. 
this I think is in uh, Rhode Island. They also had a lot of outdoor schools in some in some cities for kids who had TB. That's Providence, Rhode yeah. Island. Bundled up, they went outside. See, the point was you don't breathe the same stale air that you've got confined inside. The fresh air will do it. This is, um, I think this is in Ohio, I believe, but this is, this is what, uh, what they did for kids. I think this is New York, <coughs> and uh, we did not have outdoor schools in Ottawa. Um, I, don't, I don't think we had many kids with, with TV, but in big cities where they had it, yeah, this is what they did. Another view of that. This is the UAW Center when it opened. Um, they bought it in 1949. It was called the UAW Union Center. In 1964, they changed the name to the JFK Union Center after uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Um, I believe in the early 90s, they changed it to the Pat Greathouse Center. He was the one of the local union leaders who helped uh, buy the facility and uh, he was, oh, I, think, I think he became uh, an executive in the National Union, and he just, he did so, not only so much for the Union, but he did so much for Ottawa and the, and the center in, in Ottawa. You can see the clubhouse on the left. This would be in the 1950s, and you can see by the old cars. Um, um, <coughs> this is the pool. I mean, they, they had very good facilities. This was the hotel that was built in the 1950s, I think 1957, and it was de destroyed by the tornado of 2017. This is the new hotel that they built in its place, and I went through that. It's just beautiful, just beautiful. This is uh, inside the clubhouse. That, that fireplace <coughs> looks the same today as it did 100 years ago. You can see uh, on top of the piano some of the old bottle. I mean, the UAW, the UAW didn't have to do that. You know, um, to preserve the, the, the history of the tent county, but they did, and, and I'm happy they did. This is the entrance to the uh, clubhouse today. And you see what the, the door is going to do. And this is looking towards the doors. I mean, it's just three stories. There's the clock on the wall that we saw before, a hundred years ago. We fixed it up. This was the uh, light that hung over the front door of the clubhouse when it was built. Fixed it up, now it's inside and, and it's working for the ball. This is the dining hall today. If you remember what it looked like in the previous, I mean, it looks very similar to what it does. You can see the clock on the wall, you can see the, the serving line. This, it, this leads to the second floor. This, um, something else that the uh, UAW did was they wanted to, to uh, find one of the old huts and bring it back and, and uh, uh, fix it up again. And they did. They found, uh, I think that someone in Utica had it. When, when uh, they got rid of the huts, a lot of people bought them. They would buy them for tool sheds or you know gardening sheds or something like that. They went all over the area. They found one in Utica that had been a Utica gardening shed, and they brought it in. This is the old uh, door and doorknob. It's still original. This is how it looked when they got it. They took it in. This is the inside. The huts were not that big, so they didn't have a lot. There's a place for uh, putting your 
clothes, there's a, a cabinet underneath. That's how the hut looks today. Um, it didn't have windows back then, but I think you need them today. And uh, you know, I, I'm just so happy with, with what the UAW did. They could they could have just forgotten all about the ten colony, you know, that's in the past, but they didn't. And uh, uh, I'm just happy. With those are the photos I have. I have a lot more, you know, I have a lot more in the book. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, um, I have two questions actually. I was wondering, I didn't have no idea that electric blankets were that old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of places weren't electrified at all in the yeah. early days. I was uh -huh. surprised that and the other one was is if it's a bacterial uh, uh, disease, mm -hmm. wasn't the staff concerned about uh, getting getting the, getting the disease? It's you not, don't see any masks or anything. Uh -huh. there. No, you don't. Know, the person working in the lab. Mm -hmm. No, they didn't have masks. It's not. It was not spread as as easily as you know flu or what they say COVID is. Um, uh, that's what that's why they had signs against spitting, because you know that's that's where you catch it. Um, uh, and they didn't allow the public in. Um, so and you, you needed the, the electric blanket to keep warm. You just couldn't be under there and be on, uh, keep warm with your body. You needed that. And they had them back then. I had an uncle, uh, my uncle Pete, he, uh, from the middle of Kansas, but he went out to Denver in the late 30s mm -hmm. uh, into a tent colony back then. I think he was there for about a year and a half or so. Did he? Nobody in his family had a contract with the disease either. Did he survive? Yes. Good. Yeah. Good. That's one thing I found out is that in talking to uh, so many people, just about everybody said, oh, I had a great aunt or grandfather or something who had TB. I mean, it was so common. And it's hardly talked about at all today. He lived into his 90s. Good, good. good. If you lived, you could, yeah. Yes? Um, can you visit the UAW? Is it open to the public? Um, you can drive out there and I, you know, go up to the clubhouse and I think the door would be open to say, hey, I, I saw this in the uh, book and I, I just wanted to take a look myself. Very friendly, very accommodating. I thought there were signs that, you know, kind of um, discouraged it. I, I don't, I don't know. You know, the fact that so few people know that a tent colony was even out there at any time uh, does not bring a lot of people out there to, to look. Um, but they, they were so accommodating to me. I mean, the, the director you know, spent half a day with me, took me through the hotel, looked up, and it was just beautiful. They have another building across from the clubhouse, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, for conferences and such, and that's a big building. And then just to the west of the clubhouse, they're building a, another big conference center, which I think would be finished this year, with, with, um, a, a year or two ago, they, they had half of the building supposed to be done in 2021. I think it, I had two aunts with it, and I think another aspect is that they were separated from their young children. And so, you know, my aunt had a two-year-old and she couldn't even see them grow up for over a year. Yeah. And, and I, like I said, so many people I, I, I talked to say the same thing. We had a family member who had TB. I mean, when you have 150,000 people a year dying in the United States at that time. Everybody knew somebody or had a family member who had it. Now it's it, it's contained. What is what is it? Just a few hundred people in the United States die. It's mostly it, it's about a million and a half worldwide, but in these undeveloped countries, that's that's where it is, mainly. And yes, they had to be isolated because it was contagious. Did I understand you to say that at the beginning of your talk 
um, they were giving these heavy meals. But yes. Did you say six days a week and not seven? No, no, no. I said six meals a day. Oh, six meals a day. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought, okay. Yeah. I thought, okay. What did they do on their seventh day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Because what TB uh, did was it attacked the lungs. And that's why you needed the fresh air to, to help the lungs. And it also wasted away. That's why it was, it was always called consumption, because it consumed you. You wasted away to nothing. These people gained weight. And all the food and the milk and all this all came from the local Ottawa farmers. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was wondering, how much did it cost? You know, you said dollar thirty-three for food, but yeah, what about the doctors and all the other stuff? I mean, is it uh, like about five bucks a day or something? Well, I think I think I said it was something like between fifteen and thirty dollars a week. Is what oh, they charge okay. the patients, and they wanted the state. They wanted they wanted this to be a state facility, and the state just wouldn't appropriate money. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Pettit was determined to do it, and he did it, and he's. He should be more, uh, he should be better known today in Ottawa than he is. And he was ahead of the Illinois Medical Society at, at one time, too. So it's, 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 it's a shame. I know uh, I see all the time history kind of overlooks certain people who shouldn't be. I know that we have a, we have a statue of the radium dial throughout. And, you know, I think there should be some kind of a note to. Uh, Margaret Looney, who died, and uh, Leonard Grossman was a Chicago lawyer who took their case and fought it and won, and, and he had no, ex uh, no expense to the women. Now, they didn't get much compensation, but but uh, but he, he took, took their case and, and he fought and won. There should be some kind of a monument to him, too. Does the UAW still have that sign about if you drive a foreign car, don't park it here? No, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. I didn't see that. When I started teaching school a little bit over 50 years ago, all teachers had to have an annual chest x-ray. And they would come into the schools and test all the kids with time tests back then. Mm. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Well, when they when they closed down the uh, uh, TB sanitarium, I think it was in the mid-1980s, mid they built a, a TB clinic up on Edna Road, and I think it, I think that's closed now, too, because the TB is just not... Yeah, that was converted uh, to the health department. Was it? Okay. Health department. I, yeah, and I think they had a referendum at the time. Right. Can, can we divert the money to the TB clinic to the health department and just make it a health department? Yeah. And Dr. Pettit lived on Paul Street. Yes, he did. 900, across, across from 900 Paul with the uh, Dory High Rise. I, I think it was 1017 Paul, I 1017, think. 1017 Paul. Yeah, and then they built him a house on Center Street, just almost near where the 10th colony was. Mm -hmm. But he only lived about a year after that, so I don't even know if he occupied it because he died in the hospital. I heard a rumor when they tore that home down there on Paul Street that they had it one room where he did uh, x-ray treatments. Uh -huh. And they actually had the, the walls were lined with lead uh -huh. in, in respect to the safety. Uh -huh. Interesting, yeah. He had, a, he, before he started the tent colony, when he was just practicing med medicine, I think he had an office, office in the Maloney building, which okay. later became Little City Music, and it's torn down now. TB is basically under control in the United States. Um, but at, like I said, at one time, it, it probably has killed more people over human history than anything else. They, they have found the TB when they've uh, exhumed mummies in ancient Egypt. They found TB in, the, in the, the bones. So it goes back that far. And it, is, it, it wiped out the, half the population of Europe several times between the 1600s and 1800s. That's a lot of people. Anyone else? Yes? I worked in the uh, office in the one on Glover Street where, uh -huh. where the Ottawa Pavilion is now. Oh, okay. And they had just come out with that new drug. Yes. 
streptomycin. Streptomycin. Oh, yeah. That put an end even to the sanitariums. We don't even have any TV sanitariums anymore. No. Yeah. And we got a lot of them because it was, it was quite a disease. Yeah. I know my mother was worried that I would catch TV work on her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was it still the TV sanitarium oh, at that yeah. time? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you did take precaution, I suppose you could, but it wasn't. So, you know, they say you have to wear a mask for COVID and all this and state distancing. It wasn't quite the same with TV. I mean, somebody would have to, I don't want to say they'd almost have to spit on you, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was it, was, it was mucus. Mucus, yeah. yeah. Seems to me the nurses wore masks. Probably, yeah, because they came to, you know, direct and media close to right. In your picture there on that building to the left, I think you call it the laboratory or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was donated, the use of that was donated by the United Auto Workers from, I think, the mid-50s until 1978 uh, to a friendship house. That was their original home. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They were there until they moved to where they are now in the South Ottawa Township. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we had that free of charge for uh, the usual all those years. Okay, I know Friendship House in, in, in South Ottawa Township, that was the, uh, at that location in the, in the 1970s, wasn't it? 78. 78, okay. Yeah. yeah. Was it uh, John Sullivan? Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was a good guy. Dale. Yeah, so I think a lot of counties build sanitariums, right? Yes. So the Livingston County one, they build a huge one in Pontiac, mm -hmm. a building, and uh, replacement buildings just and it became a public county health department. So the replacement buildings being finished is taking forever, but my guess is that will be torn down in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. But it was a huge facility. Yeah. I remember seeing pictures where they would take uh, patients on the wheeled beds and then wheel them to the window of a building mm -hmm. and stick their heads outside. Mm -hmm. So the body would be inside the building and the head would be outside. Hmm, yeah, yeah. We got fresh air on the, in the lungs. And I, I, I quote a magazine article from uh, Scientific American down in South America. Uh, even today, that's what they're doing, fresh air, because they don't have it under control. And, it, it, you know, the important thing for them is just to keep the air moving. You know, if you're in a stagnant place and you're breathing the same air, that's not good. You keep the air moving, you get fresh air, it helps the lungs. And Dale's, uh, I have a picture of Dale's grandmother, and she was one of the nurses who uh, uh, helped fight TB. In the uh, streptomycin, was that, was that a vaccine or is that just something to... Antibiotic. It's antibiotic. an antibiotic. antibiotic. <laughs> So they never really had a vaccine for it because uh you know i don't know if they have a vaccine for it even now i think i think they if you get it they treat it they test you for it and they test you for it yeah and they yeah. still do i mean there's still organizations yeah. in town if yeah. you're volunteering you need to have a treatment yeah you know we have it under control mm -hmm. you, if you're in a yeah in a certain in school system and in the medical world yeah and they isolate you because it, it, it does spread, and, and, and don't think for a minute that it's wiped out or under control at all. Like I said, a million and a half people <coughs> worldwide each year die of it. I had a test years ago they used to give in all the grade schools, in all the schools, was a, a TV skin test. I didn't know the apple? Yeah. And that was a, an indicator where you had to have the test initiated and then went back the X number of days later and they came back to the schools and checked all the students. I still remember that from childhood and I still remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember when, when uh, they had the, the polio vaccine come, come out. And that was amazing because that was an, an epidemic that uh, crippled. I had my uncle was crippled with polio. He was born in 1924. And uh, he had, you know, a bad leg and a bad arm. But so, I mean, that, that was a big deal, too. Yeah. Um, I remember getting shots for the test on stuff. 
But, you know, I think what we said is supposed to, if it comes up in bubbles, mm -hmm. then they check and see if you caught whatever they were testing. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the day schools, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. centuries ago, we used to pat our arms like that so it would give a false reason. Oh. You weren't too bright. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would think that if you had it, you would want it to attend it to. But uh, I, I know, kids. I know, young, kids. Yeah. And nothing could touch us. You know, we were like the heroes on the yeah. movie camera, you know, movie theater. And, and yet you're alive today, so. <laughs> I should have been shot more than once. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, I do have uh, my, my book on this. This is where I, I learned everything. I, you know, I put it in the book if anyone is interested. So I guess uh, if I have no more questions, thank you for coming. Thank you.